The podcast you're about to hear involves true stories, which may contain graphic content that is not suitable for children. Listener's discretion is advised. This is Esoteric Oddities. Hey, y'all. Hey, guys. Bet you missed that. Yeah, we are back from our hiatus. We are. Don't hiate us. us. <laughs> All right, we're going to be logging off. Thank you for listening. Guys, um, we're super, um, I guess, hyper right now. I am. I had an extra shot of espresso, so I'm a little. Well, espresso. <laughs> <laughs> you egg corn. <laughs> uh, did you miss us? It's been two weeks. Has it been two weeks or has it been three weeks? I was going to say, is it longer than that? I think it's been three weeks for us and two weeks for them. That's true. Well, we back. Sorry to have you waiting, but we are here. We are queer. Well, we're here and ready to record. Oh. My ass is cold. I'm freezing. It's, it's um, cold about down here. 30 degrees here. So my car, I don't know if I, did I even tell the story about my car? I don't think I did. Let's rewind to the summer, this past summer, summer of 2017. Do you guys remember it? It's almost like it was last year. And <laughs> I wake up. This is June. We're at my uncle's beach house. And I wake up to my dad yelling that my car is being towed. And I'm, first off, I'm still kind of drunk from the night before. Second off, most of me is hungover from the night before. Third off, most I have of. no idea what's happening from the night before. And I thought my dad was joking because last year I told my cousin, I was going to wake my cousin Mark and tell him that his car was being towed. But then, you know, everyone was like, don't do that. And I was like, well, shit. So karma came and uh, gave me a sweet little kiss on the nipple. And um, so I go downstairs, like not thinking my dad's joking. And he's like, grab your keys here. I have no idea where my keys are hence the night before and he's like do you have your id and i <laughs> don't know where it was <laughs> so i'm like running around the house this i don't is what know what's drinking happening in the house gets you drinking a bar y'all <laughs> and it's literally like 6 6 30 in the morning and i look outside and there's a bunch of cops around my car and i'm like what's happening hide my purse what did i do what's going on <laughs> like what the hell is happening so I go downstairs and I'm like super grumpy and I open the door and there's like a younger cop. I think he was new because he was like kind of nervous and didn't really know what to do. And he's just like, do you have your license and registration? And I was it's like, it's in my car, sir. I was like, dude, are you pulling me over? Like, I'm sleeping. I'm, I'm sleep. <laughs> license I'm and slept. registration. He literally came to my door and asked for license. Like, registration. like, okay, yes. Let me just pull it out of my imaginary fucking pocket. So I go to my car and like nobody's really telling me what's going on there's like construction workers next door that are talking to the the cops and there's like five of them out there mind you the town where the beach house is is like super low-key so i assume if something happens all the cops either want to go or just go because it, like nobody's there yeah so i go and i go to my car and i can't find the <laughs> the registration i it's in there i know it's in there but like I have no it's I'm looking through all my Taco Bell sauce. <laughs> it's really embarrassing. I literally open it and it's just Taco Bell sauce packets. Amazing. Um, yeah, and I slammed it really hard and one of them exploded, but that's besides the point. Yikes. So I give it to the guys and I'm like, "Can somebody just please tell me what the hell is going on here?" Um they're doing construction on the lot next to us. Like we're going to have that the uh, that's the one with the elevator A. Hopefully we don't get stuck on it and die. Oh yeah, Not elevators. Um but they're doing construction there and i guess one of the younger kids backed up his truck into my car and he didn't hit the bumper since his truck was higher he hit like the back of my car and he put like a hole in it and that's all it was and i'm literally my heart is racing i have to pee i'm super hungover i have no idea what's going on and all because of that um yeah so i was a little uh pissed but yeah so that was back in June, and uh, they didn't get my car fixed until literally this week, and we are in January of 2018. So I'm using my mom's car, and it has heated seats. And I think that's how the story started, was heated seats. Thank you guys for listening. You've been a great crowd. Have a good night. Heated seats make me sick. They warm up my fish giblets. Yeah, it just doesn't... Have you ever, like, felt your stomach, like, cooking because you were so hot? Like, it's just, like... No, because I'm not, like, small like you. <laughs> rises up to your stomach, and I'm like, oh, my God. No, no. Never? I, I didn't have that. Oh. Um, I read an article today. So I was doing, like, some research to put shit on our Instagram, 
you know, the little facts that I do and, you know, um, and I found a fact, I'm going to probably post it when this comes out, if it's not posted already. And this man, like he created his casket and it is shaped like a PBR can. Like he got like a Paps blue ribbon can of beer and his casket is shaped like it. And he, I don't know if I'm like, I mean, like, do you woo, but I, I don't think anyone loves PBR that much. Apparently he does. And until he dies, he intends on using it as a cooler. He laced the inside with plastic, filled it with ice, and he's using it as a cooler right now with his friends. How fucking rad is that guy? Wait, so he bought this PBR-shaped coffin, but he's not dead yet? No, it's technically a casket, but I guess you can call it a coffin. Why did I call it a coffin? I and mean, people call it coffins. I just, you yeah, know. Yeah, if you were born I'm in educated. like 1962. A lot of people are born in 1962. Yeah, same people that call it a market and not a grocery store. A market. I'm going to go down to the market. Um, <laughs> but you guys aren't here to hear about the market, are you? You're here to hear about our topic today. What's our topic today, Sarah? Mummy. Mummy. So if you like the idea of a 2,000-year-old mummy with flexible joints and red blood still in her veins, or you like the thought of ancient Egyptians doing loads of cocaine. I like that. Or the thought of King Tut's penis. Um, stick around. But he's 19. That's totally legal. Oh, God. <laughs> Plus, that penis was royal. Got the royal penis. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I'll start off with the... Diamond. What was that? I was telling you to dive into the story. Oh, dive in. I thought you said diamonds. That too. I would love those. Diamonds. Right. You remember Big Ange? R.I.P. R.I.P. I love her. She followed me on Twitter. Also, R.I.P. to Dolores from the Cranberries. That was really fucking sad. And she's yeah. so young. Yeah. I'm, I'm really upset. 2017, I know it sucked for the world and like... It was a very shitty year, but also like 2016 was the year when like all the celebrities died. Died. Oh my God. All the good ones. Everyone. Okay. So speaking of dead people, let's talk about mummy. Basically. (laughs) Hey, I want my mummy. I want my mummy back. Okay. Why are we like this? (laughs) I don't know. I think think we should retire. Okay. Hi. We're going to retire now. We're going to croak. All right, so I would like to thank the Smithsonian for having such great resources online. Without them, I would have not been able to do my research or be the man who I am today. I'm holding the microphone like it's a trophy. Yeah, I know. I see you. Well, they don't. I used to pretend that I won an Oscar and I would hold the Mrs. Buttersworth maple syrup in the mirror. That really does look like an Oscar. It really does. Except it's not gold. No. But it's, you can't put your Oscar on pancakes. I guess you could, but then they get dirty. All right, so mummies. So, um... Mummification is the method of embalming and treating a dead body thousands of years ago. I mean, I think they still kind of do it today, but uh, I think you got to put in like a special order. I think they're made to order. Um, And it was popularly known uh, as an ancient Egyptian practice. So using special processes, the Egyptians removed all moisture from the body, leaving only a dried form uh, that would not decay. And it was important in the religion to preserve the dead body in as lifelike as a manner as possible. They were so successful that today we can view a mummy body of an Egyptian and we would have a good idea of what he or she looked like thousands and thousands of years ago. I think that is insane. Like, I I found some, like, crazy pictures of some mummies that looked like people or, like, you could, like, see what they looked like. And to think that they're thousands of years old is insane. You're going to that museum, the Mutter Museum. I am tomorrow. I think it's pronounced Muter. It is. Um, but that's because it has the little dots over the U. What is that called? Caliente. Oh, an, an Uber mark, because that's what Uber is too. I don't think it's called that. Oh, Uber. You okay? Uber. But uh, when you go there, there's this lady. She's called the Soap Lady, and it's literally this like dead body they have in there, and she just like hasn't decayed. Her body ended up turning into soap. Oh my god, <laughs> I was gonna do that once. I think. What you were gonna do? What? I was gonna do research on that girl. Oh, on the soap on lady. The woman. Yeah. Oh yeah, she's rad. She's cool. I think I think you told me about it probably. Yeah, but she's in Philly. She's hanging out, just laying on her back. I'm here for it. Not making any money off of the people who come and see her, but what else is new? 
Um, so the mummification uh, was practiced throughout early Egyptian history through scientific research. We can assume that the earliest mummeries, mummies, excuse me, mummeries from prehistoric times were probably accidental. Egypt has almost no measurable rainfall, so by chance, dry sand and air probably preserved bodies uh, when they were put in shallow pits into the ground. But around like 2600 BCE, during like the fourth and fifth dynasties, Egyptians were probably mummifying people intentionally. They did research on this. I don't fucking know. Um, the practice continued and developed well over 2,000 years into the Roman period. And within any one period, the quality of mummification varied, you know, depending on the price that was paid for it. Uh, and the best preserved and prepared mummies were that of the 18th through the 20th dynasties of the New Kingdom between 1570 and 1075 BCE. And this included King Tut. King yes, Tut. Yes, boo! As well as other known pharaohs. Uh, so let's talk about the process. I never really bothered to look into the process of mummification because honestly, I didn't really think about it too much. I just, I think as a child, I honestly thought that like it was just like it, it, yeah, you just died and then you got like cloth around yeah, you. It was, it was like, just like a weird like a snap of a finger and you yeah. were just like a mummy. Oh no, hundred years. Later. Oh no, no, no. <laughs> Um, so the mummif the mummification process took about 70 days to complete. That's insane. You got to have some dedicated ass people. I would have kicked the, not kicked the bucket, but I would have threw in the towel and I'm then done. kicked the bucket. Yeah. Like seven days into it. I was like, y'all, this was fun when we started it, but I, there I go again. I just start projects and don't finish them. Stop it. We're not. She's going to sneeze. <laughs> Girl, it's cold and flu season. You need a dab. Um, uh huh. I do. So, um, here comes another one. You better dab. You better dab. You better. Damn it. Why would you do that to me? I just need to let it out. Just let it out. Um, How long was the process? 70 days. Mm -hmm. You got some dedicated. <laughs> hey. It's like origami, but like less time. What the fuck does that even mean? I don't know. <laughs> I, I honestly don't like know how to respond to that. Yeah, it's very, it's exactly like origami. Oh. So back to the mummies. So special priests who had a detailed knowledge of human anatomy worked as embalmers to treat and wrap the body. So the first step in the process was to remove all internal organs um, and parts that might decay. The brain was removed by carefully inserting a special hooked instrument up through the nostrils nope. in order to pull bits out through the nose. Wait, 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 wait. Strike that. Reverse wait, it. Yeah. Okay. They were trying to get all the boogers out? And they were trying to get the brain out. Screw the boogers. The, yeah, that's how they got the brain out. I guess they just like went. It's insane to think like thousands and thousands of years ago, they were sh they they were like pulling your brain out of your nostril. How did they like know how to do that? One. Two, how did they know you had a brain? Also, why wouldn't they just cut your your head open? You're getting wrapped anyway. No one would, no one would notice. Well, because part of the religion is they wanted it to be as because oh, they believed. As I'll get to it. But yeah, they wanted like the whole body to, oh. you know be in its the egyptian culture is so sacred that they literally wanted everything intact mm -hmm. that's crazy it is ba -ba -ba, through the boogers okay it was a delicate operation one which could easily disfigure the face i'm sure you're poking shit up its nose um so the embalmers then removed organs uh through the abdomen and chest area they made super small cuts through the left side of the abdomen and they left only the heart in place believing it was the center of the person's being and intelligence so other organs were preserved separately with the stomach, liver, lungs, and intestines placed in special boxes or jars today called canopic jars. And those jars were buried with the mummy also. And in later mummies, the organs were treated, wrapped, and eventually placed back within the body. So they like really were preserving everything. The embalmers next removed all moisture from the body. And they did this by covering the body with natron, which natron, 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 natron. I it's think a, it's nitron. Sure. You don't even know. You're just like nitron. Mm -hmm. That sounds better. Nitrogen. Yeah. That's what I was thinking of. So a type of salt. Uh, it's a type of salt which has really great drying properties if you have um, really moist skin would suggest. Actually, it's probably poisonous. I'm not. I take that back. Um, please don't sue me if you do that. And it's a bad idea. Uh, so they would place additional packets of that inside the body. You know the ones you get in FedEx? Yeah. When you order mail? They had those exact ones. Really? Yeah, from FedEx. I hate you. You thought. I did. I was I like, know. oh my God, from FedEx? 
Jesus, Sarah. I told you, like, I'm just... <laughs> um, okay, so the body was left to dry for 40 days. And once the body was dried out completely, embalmers removed the internal packets and lightly washed the natron off the body. And the results was a very, very dried out but recognizable human form, which is an accurate depiction of how I feel after a night of heavy drinking. <laughs> Say Literally. that because I agree. Uh, so to make the mummy seem even more lifelike, the sunken areas of the body were filled in with linen or other materials, and sometimes false eyes were added depending on how much money the person being mummified paid them or their family, I'm, I'm assuming. So next, the wrapping began. Wrap it. Wrap it up. Okay. Each mummy needed 100 yards of linen, and that's why I keep the record spinning. Um, hey, damn, damn. <laughs> Jesus. My mixtape is dropping, and um, so are our ratings. That's dropping. <laughs> Our ratings. Sometimes they would even wrap each finger and toe separately before wrapping the entire hand or foot. They were like intricate with this shit. Yeah, mm. these people were wrapped for like thousands of years. They had to be like really thorough. Yeah. Oh, wait till I get to what happens later. Like there was some fucked up shit that happened. We'll get there. Often the priests placed masks of the person's face between the layers of head bandages, and at several stages, the form was coated with a warm resin. Then the wrapping resumed once again. At last, the priests wrapped the final cloth or shroud in place and secured it with linen straps, and the mummy, oh bitch, the mummy, oh bitch, she was complete. So the priests preparing the mummy were not the only ones busy during this time, although the tomb uh, preparation usually had begun long before the person's actual death. Now there was a deadline. So the craftsmen, workers, artists, they all worked quickly. Keep in mind that these were, I mean, people who had like this type of, of like shit with all these people working on them, they were like pharaohs or like rich people or, you know, the, the higher ups. The, um, they like had money to do all this. Yeah. Stuff. So basically what they thought was the things that were in the tomb were then carried with the person into the afterlife. Furniture and statuettes were readied because I can't make it to the gates of heaven without my lazy boy recliner. Wall paintings of religious or daily scenes were prepared and a list of food or prayers were finished. Through a magical process, they believed that these models, pictures, and lists would become the real thing in the afterlife. And everything was ready for the funeral. So as a part of the funeral, the priests performed special religious rites at the tomb's entrance. The most important part of the ceremony was called the opening of the mouth. I've had a ceremony like that as well. A priest touched to various parts. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, I should stop. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, Jesus. That got really bad really quick. No, that's... Okay, so okay, so a priest touched various parts of the mummy with a special instrument to open... Oh, I wasn't thinking about this when I wrote it. Um, The priest... I mean, they're already dead. Okay, so... Oh, my God, Sarah. You can't just say that. You were thinking it. I know, but you said it. <laughs> oh, Jesus. So there was an instrument, and they, you know, they were opening the mouth because they thought that in the afterlife... Without the ceremony, the person who was mummified could not speak or eat. Because, you know, I'm finna stop by the Mickey D's right at the Iron Gates of Heaven. I'm really not trying to be disrespectful, but that's just coming off that way. So the mummy was placed in the coffin or coffins. I don't know why I wrote that. Were they in multiple pieces? Coffins. I guess if the jars. Sarcophagus. Um, Ooh, uh, put what? I was going to sing a song. Okay. Put the lime in the coconut. Ah, uh, put the pussy in the sarcophagus. What did I say? <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> it's Adele, right? It's a great song. Wait, how do you say it? Adele? No. Sarcophagus. Suf sarcophagus. <laughs> no, for real. Don't let me be stupid out here. How do you really say it? Sarcophagus. So it's sar sarcophagus. Sarcophagus. It's sarcophagus. Is it really? No. <laughs> Damn. I feel like I'm on crack. You gullible Gabby. <laughs> so why preserve the body? I mean, it, it it's hard to explain all of it in a short amount of time. Also, I didn't do 100% of the research on that. But basically, Egyptians believed that the mummified body was the home of the soul or spirit. If the body was destroyed, the spirit might be lost. So the idea of spirit was broken into basically three different parts. The ka, the ba, and the ak. So the ka was the double of the person, and it would remain within the tomb and needed offerings and objects there. Basically, like uh, the physical being of it. The ba was the soul. Um, and it was free to fly out of the tomb and return. And the Ak was perhaps translated as the spirit, which would then travel through the underworld into the final judgment and entrance to the afterlife. So to the Egyptians, all three were essential. So that's 
kind of why they wouldn't, you know, crack through the skull and and get the brains out that way. Um, so who was mummified? I kind of touched on this already. It was basically the rich people, the nobles, you know, and uh, occasionally a peasant or so if they were cool. But it was a really expensive process, I would assume, if you think yeah. about it. You got all these people working on you for 70 days. Somebody's got to pay for that. Also, they probably get charged like by the hour times 70 days. I don't think they had hours back then. That's scary. Did they? Probably not. I, mean, I think, well, I don't know because... The Egyptians were advanced. They had to have some type of time. Yeah, but they weren't like, hey, meet me at the crick. Well, I... first, they didn't They didn't have a crick, so they weren't meeting anybody it's at the crick. It's the creek. It's the crick. I'm from the Midwest. The crick. Sister. Tales the from the crick. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I'm hiring I for a new podcast co-host. Out. I'm hiring for a new podcast co-host. If you have a mouth that makes noises, please submit your audition reel. Back to the sacred form of oh, mummification. Um, there were also sacred bulls who were mummified. There's actually a whole cemetery in this place called Saqqara, and it's all bulls. Sacred bulls, if you will. Also, baboons, cats, birds, crocodiles had great religious significance, and they were sometimes mummified as well. Um, I think King Tut was mummified with a bird. I'll let you get to it if it was in yours, because I didn't. I don't really know, but I'm pretty sure he was. I didn't. I didn't um, cover any of the like any of his mummification process. Oh, perfect, because I did. Just all of his, just all of like curses that surrounded uh, his tomb. Perfect. I love it. I got curses surrounding my womb. Hey, nobody entered this treasure. You and me both. In a couple of months. Again, if you want to slide into those D, I'm totally kidding. Back to mummies. Oh. So the study of mummies today. Again, as I said before, it's like crazy how you can look at a mummy and like know what they looked like back then. But now we don't even have to unwrap them. Because guess why, bitch? Why? Because we got x-rays. Oh. So they put like mummies on like the little x-ray thing and they Bring scan them. Me. Yeah. So we don't. We can like see what's inside. We can see the structure of their bones. We can see like medically how they were taken care of. And we can pretty much do all this insane research to know what people were doing thousands of years ago. Because these smart Egyptian people were so good at what they did. I think that's insane. I think that's insane. It's insane. Okay, so are you ready to hear about that's just like a little bit on the mummification process I'm and ret. like and the little yeah, little uh that's what do they say? That's just the tip of the tip iceberg. of the penis to ye. So <laughs> the tip of the iceberg. Uh so let's get into the cocaine mummies. Are you ready? Oh, sweetie? you were being uh, you were being uh, serious? Mm -hmm. Why couldn't I think of that word? <laughs> you were being real. <laughs> I think because we record these after we've had a long day at work, so both of us are like one, I've had two shots of espresso, which I shouldn't have because I've been cut off of coffee. I cut myself off I'm of literally coffee. running on my own stupidity. Is your refrigerator running? You better go catch it. <laughs> Is there a hole still in your ceiling? Oh, yeah. You better go patch it. I'm saying. Uh, so this was in the early, I believe it was the early 90s. I watched a documentary and I'm honestly just judging off of their poor fashion choices. It might have been the late 90s or late 80s, uh, early 90s. In Munich, Germany, Dr. Svetla Balabanova was an inventor of a groundbreaking new method or methods of um, detections in hair and sweat. I'll get there. It's interesting, I was actually. Like, did you <laughs> yep. see the way mm -hmm. I looked at you? I was like trying to put and what else? two and two together, and I'm like, mm. So she would take samples from mummies and she would pulverize them to make a solution. And then she would run tests on them to figure out all this amazing shit that people never knew before. But one day, it was probably a Tuesday. She gets her coffee. She's walking into her office. You know, she takes off her um, her jacket. She's wishing she was anywhere but here. I'm saying I hate um, work. And she finds something crazy. Tell us what it is, Zaddy. There were high amounts of cocaine in a mummy. So she was shocked and assumed it was a mistake. So she said, hold up, bitch. Put my thing down, flip it, and reverse it. And she ran tests again only to find the same turnout. So then she sent three fresh samples from different mummies in like the same that were found in the same area. Uh, so And she sent it to different researchers at different labs. And all of them ran tests on them. And guess what? They found the same result. I'm ready for this. I'm here for it. So before fraud asked Christopher Columbus in 1492 when he sailed the ocean blue on his ship of lies. Yes, y'all. I want you to know Christopher Columbus is a liar. Okay, we're not. He's an asshole. We're not going to get into it. Okay. That's a whole different ship. That ship's already sailed. So before that time, cocaine was not found anywhere else. 
uh, outside of America. Now, remember, America was, quote unquote, hard quotes, discovered. Because, you know, ain't nobody had been to America before he discovered it. There we go again on that ship. I'm sorry. It wasn't discovered. It was discovered over a thousand years after the end of the Egyptian civilization. So researchers thought that this study and finding cocaine in a mummy, they thought it was a fraud because, you know, researchers and like the when this was found out, it was like a huge deal. And all the people who were studying it were like, oh, my God, this can't be real. This has to be a fraud. This has to be a mistake, possibly contamination. Dr. What? How would people contaminate oh, mummies that. with cocaine? I got you. So uh, <gasps> Dr. Svetla used the hair shaft test. Yes. Do you have your hand up, ma'am? Yes. Oh, my God. Did they s- use the mummies to smuggle cocaine and then forgot? That's a very good point. Let me get to it. So Dr. Svetla uh, used the hair shaft test, uh, which she learned through working with police and forensics. This woman was really smart. She was obviously super into forensics, but she actually worked with the police before she like got into this or she studied with them. <laughs> Bless you. That must be a major come up. Imagine like, oh, I work for the police force and then like I work on mummies. Yeah, that's actually pretty dope. Um, I don't know if she was actually, I think she worked just with the police. I don't think she was like working for the police i think i have tissues down here i don't know if i do actually oh my, you saw me wipe my snot on my hand i wasn't gonna say it but now that it's out there I, yeah guys i wipe my snot on my hand like a child because I, my nose is runny i don't have i have napkins and i have a huge bottle of vodka the vodka okay so yes this the hair shaft test so drugs and other substances remained in hair proteins for months in a living human being but if the drugs were in the system at the time of death, the substance remained in the hair proteins forever. So this is like a process that they actually use in court still to this day to like find out, you know, if somebody was drugged and then that's how they died or they were on high amounts of drugs and they died. You can find out through fingernails and you can find out through hair follicles because once the person's dead, it's, it stays in the, it stays in your hair protein. So these mummies the cocaine was found in their hair follicles she didn't do it yet she's just explaining what the test was ah. so um so this is pretty so that's how it goes and this is basically what she was going to do the mummy hair was washed in an alcohol solution then the alcohol was the alcohol that they used to wash the hair was tested and if the alcohol came out clean then that means that the substance was coming within the hair proteins and it was not contaminated on the surface which means the human or the mummy had ingested it while alive thus ruling out contamination now something in contamination they think you know it could have been contaminated by anybody who was processing it anybody they're old as hell like i mean even though they had just found it and moved it it can be contaminated by who knows whatever who knows whatever and whoever exactly but this was like huge because this was like ancient egypt was getting a drug that was not found anywhere else in the entire world except for america which was not found quote unquote discovered until until a thousand years later and you know you can't just you know climb on spirit airlines and be like hey i'm here for the cocaine yeah okay so then in the uk so this is in germany that this woman is so now in the uk dr rosaline david was puzzled so she took Uh, samples from mummies that were stored at the Manchester Museum, and she formed a theory. Keep this theory in mind because I'm going to talk about other things later, and this is going to come back up. So in the Victorian times in Egypt, many people from all over the world would just purchase mummies and other jewelry and treasures. I don't like that. I don't like that either. buying dead people. Um, So in in the 19th century, travelers would show up frequently to mummy dealers. There were actually mummy dealers. And the dealers sometimes wouldn't have authentic ancient mummies because the supply is limited. Um, And it's proposed as a possibility. This isn't completely confirmed, but they have like scientific evidence that it is a very very possible theory that the dealers would mummify recently dead egyptians and sell them at the same price and tell them it was authentic so they were selling these people fake louis bags basically out of the trunk of their car and saying it was real so they really wanted somebody like you know king tut but instead they were getting somebody who had died recently probably worked at a call center down the street who knows so in the 16 and 1700s in europe it was a trend when people began crushing up bits of mummies and eating them in order to cure themselves of various ailments what that grows you out? Just crush it up. Oh yeah, not just a little. That's nasty. Snack on it. Put it in your. You're not gonna trail want to do that when you hear what I got to say. Oh God. Okay. So this led people to believe that even drinking blood would cure blood-related diseases, and eating crushed up pieces of human skulls could cure issues with their brains. What? That's mm-hmm. like two negatives don't equal a positive. Yeah, but back then people didn't know stuff. That's true. I guess they could have went on the Wikipedia, but... The wiki. 
I guess their Wi-Fi was really slow back then. Uh, so researchers found out later that the demand stripped the supply, obviously. And when there was no more access to mummies left, they couldn't find any more or they were like protected by some laws, I'm sure, <laughs> because they're dead bodies and shouldn't be sold on the black market. But that's just me. You know, they were taking bodies of convicted felons. This is alleged. This is what they're assuming. But they have evidence to say that this is what happened, that they were taking the bodies of convicted felons, drying them out and selling their parts in separate pieces as mummies throughout Europe. So carbon dating on mummies tends to be tedious and shows up sometimes incorrect. So scientists gather their information of authenticity based on what excavation location these mummies were found in. So again, I'm saying not for sure, but you get it. So Dr. David went from the UK to Germany to see the mummies, uh, which were found with cocaine in them. And through paperwork and research, she stated that the mummies in Munich were most likely genuine. Uh, and somehow the ancient Egypts got a drug that was found in only America. But this one dude mentioned that before the settlement was found to scientists, to researchers, to scholars, the idea of Vikings coming to America was laughable. But then we obviously know that the Vikings did come to America. I'm sorry if I'm talking fast. The espresso is like really kicking in. I was going to say, are you good? <laughs> Good thing I didn't get the 24 ounce. I was going to get the 24 ounce with two shots of espresso. Girls, it's my wild night in tonight. So now they're thinking, <laughs> oh shit, Cleopatra wanted to go party, you know, with Miss Lohan and the Olsen twins. Aphrodite. And she, won she wanted to go across the ocean, you know, to get some blow. But then they're like, well, shit, maybe Where's they... Where's the fucking blow? <laughs> maybe Sorry. they did go to America, but maybe they didn't go on the Atlantic. And then they start... They started to form this theory and they were like, hmm, well, maybe they did have worldwide trade back then. They had like a worldwide trading network, right? And yeah, people, like underground. Well, yeah, underground, but technically like, not underground yeah, because like above of the water. Ground, but people like didn't know. But on the low. And they were so rich that they probably had connections everywhere. But think about how, think about how long ago that was. Think about just like, they didn't know what the world looked like. Like we can look at Google Maps and literally see a fucking like satellite image of what the world looks like they didn't know like, oh, right. so they didn't know like how big it was they didn't know where the other out. land was like you just basically get on a ship and think about how to get to another country like it can take months also that's scary as shit to be on a boat at night. yeah uh -uh. at night when it storms first off i think i've spoken about it before but my realization of how much i fear the water though, though i the hate ocean, the ocean it's so scary i don't like it it's like it's wet it's the unknown it's unknown they got like it's fascinating. It's cool, but like I'll watch it. Like I was watching the documentary. Oceans, have you ever watched that one? No, I was watching the Blue Planet. I think it's called. It was oh. like a documentary from two thousand one. I was watching it on Netflix with Jason and my brother. And honestly, uh, fuck that. I think I'll just watch the documentary because that shit is too scurry for me. My brother um, loves, loves, loves the ocean. I know he does. <laughs> where what was i even saying oh. oh okay so the they were thinking that maybe people were going across the world and they were you know collecting worldly goods um because also with the cocaine they had found tobacco and tobacco hadn't been found in e ancient egypt either it had been found with the native americans in america um oh so they were traveling here well they don't know basically that's the end of my story because all we know is that there was cocaine in their system and the right. cocaine was only ever found in america like they found that the growing conditions were not possible in in egypt in, egypt, oh, in okay. a desert there's no way that it could have been in any area they weren't to our knowledge trading with anybody who would have had it or could have gotten it to them so obviously it would have had been some possible way because it wasn't just like the stuff that's found in cocaine it was like straight up like cocaine oh shit yeah that they found within the bodies <clears throat> so we may never know they were partying and heard yo apparently the ancient egyptians could get down on a friday night or a tuesday morning if you were me junior year of college you are the people you surround yourselves with i'm totally just kidding not really kidding you guys make good choices surround yourself with good people sometimes you need a little pick me up you know yeah i my pick me up was <laughs> espresso it was kind of a bad idea espresso so that was the cocaine mummy baby what do you think you ready to party? I'm always ready to party. Me too, but give me till the end of the podcast and I'm going to be sleep. Same. I'm <laughs> ready to go to bed. Um, You're like, I'm always ready to party. Same. I'm ready to go to bed. <laughs> I have like two different sides. I have like the extreme partier and then the extreme napper. Netflixer. <laughs> literally. I literally will nap every time I come home from work. Sometimes napping like really fucks me up. Like it can ruin my sleep schedule for like a couple days. Oh, shit. Because 
everybody power naps you know power napping it's like where you no i don't power nap i literally fall asleep for like four hours that's me because everyone's like power nap nap for 20 minutes first off okay living with anxiety you cannot shut your brain off that fast Ever. like jason and my brother can fall asleep within like seconds like my brother i can be talking to him and if he's tired he'll be out I same with jason me. like and they can so they people can sleep anywhere like i cannot fall asleep on a plane i tried oh i don't i don't like people looking at me when i sleep so i, feel I like don't people care are looking at me and that makes me not want to sleep take a picture it lasts longer but like i don't care if people are looking at me i guess that is kind of weird if people are watching me sleep like um, on the bus like when i come here and i take that long fucking bus ride yeah i just i can't do i it. don't even I, i'll be so tired but i can't because i people like i could feel people looking at me uh-uh. i would be afraid i'd miss my bus stop i mean it's really long time it's a really long bus ride <laughs> that's true um do you want to talk about king todd's penis Sure. I was hoping you would bring it up. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Anytime. For bringing it up. You guys, this is a great piece of um, information to have at your fingertips to bring out at a social gathering, parties, work events, uh, work meetings. King Tut's penis was mummified in a 90 degree angle, making it look erect. So according to Egyptianologist Selima Ikaram, the mummified erect penis and other burial anomalies were not accidents during embalming, but rather deliberate attempts to make the king appear as Osiris, the god of the underworld, as okay. literally as possible. Apparently he had a big schlong and he liked to show it off. King Tut? No, the uh, Osiris. Oh. Hanging out with his wang out. So the erect penis evokes... I cannot keep saying that. Like, you guys wanted quality content when we came back? Um, think again. There was also a black liquid that was found on King Tut's mummy, which he, are believed to be a couple things. Somebody said, like, soot from a fire. Somebody said some other bullshit. Um, but this guy who was saying this, he said that it, it was a liquid that was made to look like the skin color of Osiris. And King Tut's heart was also taken out, which recalled the story of Osiris's heart being cut out by his brother, Seth. Imagine like having a name like Osiris and, and then, Seth. Yes, I was just going to say that. Wait, how do you get <laughs> Osiris and then go right to Seth? Like, oh my are God. you good? So yeah, Seth cut out his brother's heart and cut it into pieces. My heart was cut into pieces, too, the day that One Direction broke up. Still not over it. Still not over it. So this guy believes that making the king appear as Osiris would help him undo a religious revolution that was happening, brought to you by this guy named Akhen Akhenaten. Akhenaten. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was a pharaoh who was widely believed to be King Tut's father. So apparently this dude tried to focus Egyptian religion around the worship of Aten, the sun disk. He went as far as destroying other images of other gods. So uh, this researcher said that King Tut and his followers were trying to undo the changes that were coming to Egypt, especially after King Tut died. And the tradition of religion, you know, they were trying to, they were, they were basically, they were trying to bring it back to the old stomping grounds, you know? So yeah, that's King Tut's penis. Fun facts, isn't it? I have a really fun fact and I can't wait to share it with you. And I know you're going to be like, Sarah, I knew that, but I didn't know that. So, <laughs> Okay. I'm almost done, but I'm really excited about this next part. So the best. You're not excited about the penis part? No. Oh. I'm fine. over it. I'm not. So uh, the best preserved 2,100 year old mummy was found in China with blood in her veins, flexible joints, and intact organs. See? 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 So I got this information from Ask a Mortician on YouTube. Her name is Caitlin Dowdy. I sw if you listen to this podcast and it fascinates you, I highly encourage you to go look her up. She is a mortician, obviously, Ask a Mortician, and she's so funny, and I think she's super informative in like a very entertaining way, especially if you like dark shit. And you have like a nerdy sense of humor. She's awesome. And if she listens to this, which she probably doesn't, hey girl, hey love you so much. Pre-ordered you. your book. Um, so the first thing I noticed, they have photographs of this woman. First thing I noticed was this woman's face. Like I'm sure she was a looker back in her day when she was alive, but like she needs a chemical peel or an exfoliation or some shit. She probably just needs Jesus. So in 1972 in China, in the Hunan province, a group of workers digging an air raid shelter in the Ma Wang Dui Hills, uh, they came across a massive tomb. And inside this tomb, bitch, take a shot every time I say bitch, inside this tomb, bitch, they found a body <laughs> that did not seem to have decayed. It was the body of Zin Zhu Yi, or Lady Dai, who she was later, not actually, not Lady Dai, D-I. Is it D-Y-E? No, it's D-A-E. Oh. Or D-A-I. Oh. Hi, how are you? 
lady die. Hey, how are you? I can spell. So she lived during the Han Dynasty, which was in 206 BCE to 220 AD. And she was the wife of the Marquis of Dai. Her complexion was soft. This is a dead body that has been dead for over 2,100 years. Her complexion was I'm soft. Scared. All of her skin was elastic. She had this skin. Like, the color of her flesh was, like, the color of living flesh. Her entire face, along with the rest of her body, was totally intact. She seemed to be almost fresh. Her limbs and joints, bitch, they were flexible. Baby girl could do gymnastics. Okay, wait, wait. How she was buried was they didn't literally stumble across a tomb, open it up, and they were like, oh, hey, look at this girl. She's still fresh. She was flexible. She had her own hair. She had eyelashes. She had nose hair. However... Once the human body was taken out of the tomb, she began to decay slightly. So any pictures you see of her now, she's slightly decayed. And she even looks pretty great there. I mean, not great. Like, I wouldn't date her. But, like, for... You don't even like girls. True. Let alone dead girls. But, um, <laughs> like, for how old she was, she, like, looks really good in pictures after they took her into the sunlight and gave her, like, fresh air and shit. So um, scientists who reviewed the mummy say her body holds as much information as a fresh corpse bitch yikes isn't that insane scary so they found that she still had red blood in her veins every organ was present and there was even undigested melon seeds in her stomach stop how two hundred thousand years they found out what she was eating two thousand one hundred years over two thousand one hundred years ago they found out what she was eating when she died so they found she had died from a heart disease from a life of unhealthy eating and lack of exercise lady die aka me Me, because that's where i'm gonna go Mm -hmm. so she died around the age of 50 uh and her body from the from her body they can tell when she died she was eating a huge meal and she had some musk melon for dessert so scientists know that it takes about an hour for the body to digest melon seeds, which means she died within one hour of eating her beloved melons, baby. <laughs> so before I die, I kind of want to swallow like a small capsule. So I just want to swallow a small capsule or like a plastic Easter egg that has like a little note inside that says peekaboo or like add me or subscribe to my podcast. Like, hey, bitch. Or like a unopened five hour energy bottle for the autopsy dude to drink. I like that. Yeah, he's Very, probably uh, really tired. Hospitable. I mean, if the seal isn't broken, the FDA says it's safe to consume. Consume? Yes, that's it. I think we're um I think we're losing it. Can't lose what you never had. A gallstone plugged up a bile duct in her body, which caused her excruciating pain, sending her into cardiac arrest. Ultimately, she died of a heart attack. They were able to tell from detailed information that the mummy was over 2,100 years old. But how? Well, I'm glad you asked, Sarah. Thank you for asking. She was buried <laughs> in she was buried 12 meters below the ground, and basically the cold earth acted as a natural refrigerator. No way. Her body was wrapped very tightly with 20 layers of silk, which helped suffocate any bacteria in and around I the body. I was gonna say I mm-hmm. knew her being wrapped had something to do with it, but I thought they preserved her, like gave her something in order for her to like stay intact. Like, you know how we embalm people? Yeah. I thought it would be something like that. But this was like all natural. Oh, natural. Basically. Um, yeah, kind of. Uh, so the mummy was placed inside a coffin, which was sealed with a thick lacquer. Then another coffin and more lacquer and another and more lacquer. Can you? And another and more lacquer. That brings us to four total caskets and layers of lacquer total. Can you, when I die, can you make sure that I'm buried this way? The same exact way? Yeah. Like, don't leave out a step. Sure. Like, the melons and all. Yeah. If I die, can you make sure that my coffin is filled with hot Cheetos? That, you already told me that. Okay. Well, I just didn't know if you, um. I'm just kidding. You never told me that. <laughs> had remembered. Um, flaming hot or regular? Flaming hot. Are you kidding me? What about uh, Takis? Hot Cheetos and Takis. No, I just want Hot Cheetos. Okay. And like pop a Mountain Dew in there. But don't let my mom know I'm not allowed to drink soda after I die. I'm not even allowed to drink soda after 7 o'clock. I got you. Don't and worry. And this is literally why. It's 8.22 and I'm like, hey, y'all. Bouncing off the fucking walls. Off the fucking walls. They're not even padded. I'm going to get a bruise. Okay, so then the coffin was placed in a clay-lined burial vault. Five tons of charcoal were packed on top of the vault and one meter thick layer of moisturizing of moisture blocking, sorry, moisture blocking clay was placed over the charcoal. So they found her body was buried with a mixture of cinnabar and mercury ore, magnesium, and possibly salt. They weren't really sure what that shit was. But also when they opened the lid, bitch, 
say it. They found the body was soaked in a red fluid, which filled pretty much the entire coffin that the mummy was laying in. Now, the fluid may have been some... It could have been the secret of, like, how she was preserved so finely. See, I knew there was something. But... Scientists were not able to find out if it was put in there before she was buried or that over 2,100 years tiny water molecules of vapor made their way in because honestly it's inevitable. So they weren't really sure of what it was, but what I am sure of that it probably smelled fucking awful, whatever that red fluid is, I'll give you $5 in a Snickers bar if you drink it. Okay. Okay, scratch that. I want to be mummified in, okay, instead of linen, I want you to wrap me in the Pillsbury croissant roll things. All right. And then I want you to put me in a vat of marinara sauce. Okay inside the sarcophagus and then i want you to season it um oregano parsley onion powder uh mccormick not sponsored and then i want you to take fresh mozzarella the freshest mozzarella in all the land and i want you to sprinkle it on the top of my sarcophagus okay but you do know the dough isn't cooked right so but i don't care because you know what they're gonna call me pizza tut bit pizza tut tut. go home i am home i am home (laughs) I ain't going no motherfucker. I'm home. <laughs> I need so, help. So that's Lady Di. Isn't that in- incredible? <sighs> I highly encourage you to look up pictures of her. It's kind of gnarly. Like her wow. face doesn't look like a human face. I mean, it kind of looks like somebody. I would hope not because that would just be too advanced for me and I'd have to go. Yo, but you can tell that it's like a human. But to know that, to look at that it and know that it's over 2K. <laughs> years old yes. dude she's been through it she has seen she's it been all sleeping for a while i need to sleep for two hundred thousand years it wasn't two hundred thousand it was two thousand one hundred why do i keep getting up? i don't know but that's a lot that's a big difference that's why i was like wait um i think i'm missing something you are all right um i think i'm going a little over on my time i certainly am i have one more story i'll try to make it short so i'm sorry this is my last one i'm super enthralled is that a word of the day? No. So this is... Enthralled. Is that a word? Mm-hmm. I'm nodding, but I don't know. She's looking it up in her pocket dictionary. Why do you carry a fucking dictionary around with you, you weirdo? Ew. Because I'm smart. It has pages. <laughs> so gross. So mummy unwrapping parties took place in the Victorian era. Remember when I told you during the cocaine mummies? Um, so people could buy that. mummies and then unwrap them at their parties just for fun. Mm-hmm. Like what? So it's like bobbing for apples. Yeah, but disrespecting dead people. Wait, that's why the, there's a game, the mummy wrap. Oh, with the toilet paper. Yeah. No, I, I think that's just like a fun game that mummies that people play around Halloween. Uh, with the toilet paper. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. Are you maybe? Mm, something's fishy. <laughs> Dude, close your legs then. Never. So Egyptomania was part of the 19th century craze and found its expression in everything from heavy Cleopatra eyeliner to elaborate headdresses to Victorian mummy unwrapping parties. The Victorians were obsessed with death. And they were seriously into mourning rituals. That's mourning M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, not mourning because they didn't give a fuck about a brushed tooth. So Yeah, also they did a whole bunch of cocaine. So who's up at, in the morning? Yeah. Um, it's like a majorly disrespectful way of cultural appropriation, which, you know, some people today would justify as honoring the Egyptians, but I got some shit to say about that. Basically, they were looking like generic brand Cleopatras and unwrapping dead bodies that were peacefully at rest for no reason, just because they could afford it, just because they could, just because, you know, they were like, whatever. So mummy unwrapping parties were based like basically gatherings where corpses, mummies, were debandaged while people drank heavily. So the mummies, like real mummies were imported and it was extremely expensive. So rich people were doing this. All across the land, don't you know? So Thomas Pettigrew, uh, not to be confused with his distant cousin Peter Pettigrew, Harry Potter reference, 10 points for Gryffindor. Oh uh, my God, are you good? I literally don't know. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I didn't drink. I haven't smoked anything. I literally drank an espresso like two hours ago. Um, <laughs> so he was friends with with artists and authors, including Charles Dickinson. He also knew how to spin scientific theory into a fascinating spectacle, quite literally. On January 15th, 1834, in London Anthropology Museum, he invited people from far and wide to observe a unique mummy unwrapping. The gig was sold out and standing room only. He had a female, real mummy. She was placed in a contraption that made it seem like she was dancing as the bandages unraveled around her. Eye roll. Yeah, so... um. Duke Wellington, Duke Wellington, 
Isn't that a sandwich? <laughs> Is that a sandwich? I'm gonna look that up. I don't think so. Yeah, can I get a Duke Wellington, please, and hold the mustard and the pickles? A f- oh no, he's a he's a person. It's not a sandwich at all. What were you thinking? Oh, about? I was thinking of a Reuben. Oh my fucking oh wow. So basically, rumor had it that Duke, the Duke of Hamilton, was so impressed that he wanted to be mummified by this dude himself. And in 1852, that happened. What happened? I almost burped. Oh. <laughs> so it wasn't just the corpse itself that uh, that entertained people. It was the idea of various conditions that they might be, you know, the body might be found. And it was literally like opening a present. It was like, you know, when people were doing the eBay mystery boxes. Did you hear about that? It was like no. a YouTube craze. Basically, that would be so fun. It was like a theme. So it was like 90s theme, 80s theme, like football theme, basketball oh, okay. theme. And they'll list like kind of generally the types of things that are in there. They'll say how much it would go for if they were sold individually and they would knock the price down and you, they wouldn't tell you what it was. And they send them to people. So basically that's what people were doing, except instead of using eBay, they were just illegally using the black market and buying dead bodies. Disrespectful? Mm, I think so. I'm going to check yes in that box. Check yes for Juliet. So on occasion, for example, an unwrapped mummy was found to have a head full of sand. If I got that one, I'd be like, all right, come on, y'all. Really? <laughs> this is it? A head full of sand? Um, like what? But what else did they have? Like, so in another instance, want? a corpse uh, under layers of bandages had fused, like the bandages had fused with the body and it made it impossible for the gawkers to distinguish the fabric from the flesh. So when they were peeling it back, like flesh was coming off. I don't know, y'all. People like I'm dark and I'm weird, but I would never do this I shit. I would never do that. That's fucked up. Not because it's gross, but because that's like that's a person like trying to sleep. This like one of the most fascinating discoveries involved a revelation that a female mummy, long rumored to have been an Egyptian princess, was actually a man with a penis. And another thing party hosts would do would they would unravel the mummies just a little bit, not to get to the skin, but they would unravel the mummies. They would hide things like perfumes, trinkets, and shit, like. Not actual shit, but like just random stuff that rich people have laying around the house, like million dollar bills. They would wrap it in the linen. So when their friends came over and they were like fucking drinking their highballs and they were getting lit in the bathroom, they would be like unwrapping and be like, oh, my God, I got Chanel number five. Like, oh, my God. Like, I got like, what did you get, Martha? I got socks. Like (laughs) fucking Martha's always got socks. It's literally like a fucked up, disrespectful scavenger hunt. Literally, though. Um, Also, you're like, why are you shoving things in here? (sighs) I don't know. So I would like to give a shout out to Lisa Flowers from Ranker for that riveting last fun fact. So who the hell came up with this idea? Like, where? Did, how did this start? Literally, think about it. It's in like the Victorian era. And people in England are like, you know what? I'm fucking sick of this party. I'm sick of this goddamn Lana Del Rey song. Okay, these I drinks are so dry. You know what this party needs? Bring a in the fucking mummies. mummy. This party needs a fucking mummy. Like, who came up with that? I don't know. But the fact that they even like were for sale to unwrap yeah people like went out of their way to go to another country to go to egypt to like buy mummies which they were probably just buying like criminals who were buried recently they were making a pretty penny over there doing some dirty work but i'm a firm believer in karma sweetie so that's it that's all i gotta say about mummies that's all (laughs) that's all wow um um i'm sorry i took pretty much the floor for that whole thing i was mine will not be that long and mine's only one topic, so please stay with me because I don't have the... Okay. Take me there, babe. Greatness of it being a million different topics. I'm sorry. I do research and then I can't stop. No, it's so fine. I'm not blaming you. That's interesting. Okay. Take me there. All right. So, are you guys familiar with the Curse of the Pharaohs? Yes. Are you? No. Okay. Well, you know, you go into a tomb and you're cursed for life. That's what they say. Oh, that was it? Yeah, literally. (laughs) Well, fuck. I've heard of that before. You know, the movie The Mummy? (laughs) Exactly. So, um... Yo, Brandon Fraser used to be that boy. Right? What happened to him? Oh, he's still a snack. Okay, really? He's just like an expired snack that you probably shouldn't nibble on. Your mom tells you not to, but you're just like, gotta get that chocolate chip, baby. Allegedly, the curse of the pharaohs refers to a curse believed to be cast upon any person who disturbs the mummy of an ancient Egyptian person, especially a pharaoh. This curse especially goes for thieves and archaeologists. Allegedly, this curse can cause bad luck, illness, or death. I love how you literally are using the word, like, allegedly, like it. (laughs) Yeah, because... Gotta have your ass covered. Well, so, in 
the way I wanted this set up is I wanted to break it down in what I think and what my theory is. Mm -hmm. I don't want to ruin it until the end. Okay. Go ahead. Just break it down. You don't got to explain to me. I'm sorry. I keep interrupting. No, it's okay. Um, So this is a quote. Um, Cursed be those that disrupt the rest of the Pharaoh. They that shall break the seal of this tomb shall meet death by a disease which no doctor can diagnose. This was an an inscription reported to have been carved on an Egyptian royal tomb. Egyptians... (laughs) Egyptians. Egyptians. (laughs) Egypt was and is one of a kind in many ways. From its deities, which are gods or goddesses, um, part animal, part human rulers who were gods on earth, preparations for afterlife such as tombs, and even hieroglyphics that some could not read or interpret. As a result, Egypt managed to inspire both awe and fear in foreigners who encountered its culture. Today, products of ancient Egyptian civilization have survived more than 3,000 years and provided visible proof of its advanced culture. However, such accomplishments have provided rumors such as some believing Egyptian building techniques, literature, art, and mathematics came from an alien culture from outer space rather than it being purely scholarly knowledge. Oh, I'm so ready for this. People who believe this theory are referred to as <laughs> pyramidians. <laughs> oh, don't tell that to my dad. He, oh, really? Well, he I think he heard this one joke on TV somewhere and he just like loves it and he he brings it up a lot. When, he literally says pyramidians? No, he oh. doesn't say that, but he says like when they ancient aliens like we're all trying to figure out what these like scriptures are on the wall and he said and he said the pyramids are literally just fast food chains and those are the menus on the wall robbie it's funny so cute (laughs) i really love your dad i love my dad too hi dad hey dad so um yes you heard that correctly pyramidians i love that me too and i literally say it again the term (laughs) pyramidians i literally love that word (laughs) is a term said to be coined by Leonard Cottrell in his 1956 book called The Great Mountains of Pharaoh. The book included a chapter named The Great Pyramidiot, referring to Piazzi Smith's theory that humans couldn't possibly have built pyramids on their own and they had to build from some extraterrestrial source. That caused people to believe the theory of the curse of the pharaohs is real. Oh god. The phrase Curse of the Pharaohs has been used in the last hundred years or so. This phrase was coined to excuse the cause of a large assortment of disasters such as natural disasters to mild stomach disorders that often make tourists sick. Also known as the Pharaoh's Revenge or Gippy Tummy derived from Egyptian tummy. Mom, I can't go to school today. I got the Gippy Gippy Tummy. tummy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this brings us to the that. i'm saying gippy dummy have you ever heard that i've never heard of that in my entire life and i, I re- could i could have went the rest of my life without hearing it i remember one time this boy in my art class made fun of me because i said my my tummy hurt and i didn't say my stomach hurt <laughs> yeah what an asshole i'll literally never forget that one time in art class i farted and i pretended it was the chair I love that. I farted while the teacher was talking and it was really quiet. Oh my God, this chair. <laughs> Literally, I was like sitting on a stool and I looked at my classmates. I was like, this is so loud. This chair is incredible. Oh and my God, stop. Clearly. You're like one of those. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this brings us to the curse of King Tut. In early 1922, Howard Carter, a British archaeologist, opened the tomb of King Tut. Alongside him was his friend George Herbert. This um, George Herbert guy, he was like a financer, so he had money to excavate the tomb. Okay. Also known as the fifth Earl of Carnarvon. Okay. Sure, that sounds right. It sounds I'm like we just make things up. Going to guess that? I don't no, know. that's what it is. That's a fact. If you say it with confidence, people will believe us. Okay, I love it. You heard it here first. That's a fact, allegedly. <laughs> Sue me now, bitch. Two months after entering Tut's tomb, Herbert was dead. He was killed by blood poisoning from an infected mosquito bite on his cheek. Ooh. Newspapers blamed the mummy's curse or curse of the pharaohs. I bet the fuck they did. They're trying to sell some copies. Right. Um, The rumors increased after the sudden early deaths of several others connected to the excavation of Tut's tomb. But is the curse real? Oh, my God. Is it real, Sarah? In 
2002, the British Medical Journal did a study on 44 Westerners that Carter identified as being in Egypt when the tomb was invaded. This study took the survival rates and compared the average age of death for the 25 individuals present at the tomb with other individuals that were not present. So, I guess 25 weren't. 25 weren't. Right. 44. It was... No, no it was 50. baby girl. It's we just, so we fun. literally just took the SATs. It's so fun. Not the real SATs. We like did a video and we took the drunk SATs where we take a shot every time we get it. That was bad. It was bad. I hate high school. Me too. There was no significant association between potential exposure to mummy's curse and survival. Carter died on March 2nd, 1939 of natural causes at the age of 67, more than 17 years after he discovered Tut's tomb. So, from the time Tut's tomb was discovered in 1922, it it was surrounded by a lot of controversy. It took both Carter and Herbert six years to find the tomb. (coughs) Both were granted access, access to excavate Tut's tomb by the Egyptian government. In the end, the excavation was stopped due to the Egyptian government wanting to keep the tomb intact along with contents in it. Why would... I'm why would you very... say yeah and then be like no? Well, why would they say yes in the first place? I guess money is like a thing. Well, if you... this guy was like a financer. <sighs> and I'm, I'm just curious as to how they like... I guess I could look it up. For me, I I think what they did is they told them they were looking for um, Egyptian artifacts to um, bring to museums. Right. Or they were doing research or something. I guess. I guess you got to crack it open sometime. Right. But it was really fucked up because these people obviously weren't there for the knowledge. Right. I mean, they could have been there for the knowledge. I could literally watch a documentary and get all these questions answered. But I want to know from you. Yes. I want you to make um, make up the facts. Make it up. In the end, the excavation was stopped due to the Egyptian government wanting to keep the tomb intact along with contents in the tomb. After four years of being in the laboratory, the findings were sent to the Cario Museum. Cario? Okay. Sure. Soon after, curses were being discovered in inscriptions. Reporters published a photograph of the large golden shrine in the burial chamber together with a translation of the inscription. They who enter this sacred tomb shall swift be visited by wings of death. The card figure of a winged goddess that accompanied the shrine would no doubt reinforce the translated threat. Um, this actually came from the Book of Dead, and it was a collection of spells intended to ensure eternal life. So it wasn't meant to shorten life. Right. Reputation of Tut's curse worsened as people who could be associated with Herbert or the tomb started to die. Rational explanations of death were overlooked by reporters. Naturally. Right. The press had a field day when Carter's conservator passed away. Regardless of A.C. Mace, that's a conservator. A.C. Moore. Yeah, sure. Passing of old age, people still played into the curse. After the passing of Mace was Herbert's friend who remained unnamed. Then the Egyptologist, archaeologist, and writer Weigel, whom Carter and Herbert had attempted to keep out of the tomb under any circumstances. He also died. (gasps) Shook. Supposedly from the curse. An Egyptian prince was murdered by his ex-wife in the media, then to blame the curse. The media then made reports of workmen from museums all over the world passing away. These people never even visited Tut's tomb. People started cleaning their basements and attics and sending their Egyptian relics away to avoid the curse. Amazing. The above information is all good, but um, it neglects two points. Ooh. Um, so there could have very well been um, natural pneumonia in Tut's tomb. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Um, that could cause disease or mold or spores. It is a fact that paleopathologists and microbiologists now suggest that mummies can be examined by people wearing gloves and masks to to prevent the spread of any infection. Um, There was an article in the Philadelphia Inquirer that um, basically said that fungus, not a curse, killed the finder of King Tut's tomb. Hmm. Didn't he get stung by a mosquito? Yeah. But for everyone else. Oh. Um, but that still doesn't explain um, 
Carter, who died 17 years later. Yeah, but he died 17 years later. I'm saying, so it couldn't, if it was mold or something, it would have got him much, you know, Unless like much faster. It could have, but I feel like maybe they weren't affected the same way. Maybe he had a weaker immune system, so he flopped. That is true. Um, also, the second point is that ancient Egyptians did fact did in fact use curses. Most of them are in the form of threats, and they occur mainly on the monuments of private citizens rather than those of royalty. This observation may indicate that royal royalty had protection against its enemies through other sources. Most curses come from inscriptions on the walls of private tombs of the Old Kingdom during a time when the royal tombs pyramids were decorated with a set of spells called pyramid texts that were meant to use as aids advice and directions for the king so what if that that thing that was like written on the walls or wherever the hell it was written what if it wasn't like a curse basically all it said was you know those who open this they gonna die right they could have been like, y'all going to get spores in here. Get out of here. Right, I'm saying. And everyone's like, it's a curse. But they're really just like, y'all, we got germs. We old as hell. <laughs> um, so when royal curses do occur, they are directed more towards this life than the next. There is a saying by Deir el Bari. So he's the um, reigning pharaoh of Hatshepsut. I'm so sorry, guys. Um, basically, he says, who will adore her, he will live. He who will speak evil and curse against her majesty, he will die. So these curses against foreign states or people that might act or had already acted against Egypt. So I'm my theory is these curses are not real. <sighs> but you're somebody who like loves I sense. And that's why I did this, because I wanted to believe in it so much. But it's just like, after doing all this research, it seems more or less as like... A marketing thing. They wanted to sell the papers. Like reporters just... Yeah, 100%. Like putting shit in there. I mean, there could be cases that we don't even know that people didn't cover at all. Because it's like, let's say, if it's something like a curse, I feel like there are things that like the universe will just kind of not have you find out. Hmm. So if it is real, I feel like no one would know about it. But Spooky. F- for me, I'm going to say it's not. It just seems too much of like coincidence over actual fact. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a agree with you. I would have to dive into it a little bit deeper. But from what you're saying. This article's point of view and every article I've read, I'm saying that it seems like everyone's pinning it as a coincidence because they never they don't have actual facts to push it being a curse i'm not saying the There's, curses like aren't real but i right. feel like if they were you wouldn't know about it or I don't, can you even put facts to a curse you can like line up facts but at the same time when it comes to curses people can only explain them as like a coincidence that's true curse is just like a phenomenon that can't it's like a literally cannot be proven right you can say like um like the bee stinging Herbert could have been a curse. Like it's it could have been, oh, right? Yeah, that could have been part of the curse, right? Like I that mean, could it, just be yeah. It. Then it gets like kind of murky with how you look at the situation. So like the poltergeist curse, right? Like yeah. you know about it, and all those crazy things happened, and it seems like it would be a curse. I'm gonna say that for a whole episode. I'm gonna do a whole episode about that. But like at the same time, is it a curse or is it just like a coincidence? Coincidences? Or is it coincidence that is a curse? Yeah. And it's just like that's that's what a curse would be though. It wouldn't be something that's like in your face. It would be something that would be pinned as a coincidence. But it could also be in your face. That's true. But like I'm saying, like something like a mosquito, that's like this person thinks, oh, that's just, like it's a coincidence. Right. But, you know, when you, like, watch all the old Goosebumps episodes and that Kim Possible episode, like, the little jewels and stuff, like, they're always cursed. They have, right. like, an ancient Egyptian curse. Yeah, I'm saying. hmm V spooky. Are you ready for your fun fact? Oh, I don't know if I'm ready for the fun fact. I'm ready for mine. You want me to go first? Wait. Was I thinking of Beef Wellington? Who's I totally that? was thinking. Of, okay, so I said, okay, perfect. Beef Wellington is a preparation of a flayed steak. Uh, oh, wow. Coated in pate and other shit. Oh, it, with a puff pastry. Okay. Ew, that sounds nasty, like stroganoff or something. Did you know? Tell me. A butt, B U T T, was a medieval unit of measurement of wine. Yes, I'll have one Kim Kardashian of the Cabernet. That's funny as shit. I'll have I have one butt, please. <laughs> one butt. Just one cheek. I'm not that thirsty. 
one bot, please. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you guys. We certainly came back uh, fucking weird. Yeah, we did. Definitely wow. not going to drink espresso before next week's. It's because I was tired after work and I was like, you know Honestly, what I need? I'm espresso. S- I literally spent eight hours today just working and usually i'll like i have like an hour i'll have like 30 minutes and i just sit and do mindless shit not today not today satan not today junior well thank you guys again thanks um, for listening if you want to support the show you can go to patreon.com slash esoteric oddities you can get a bonus episode a month leave us a rating on whatever you're listening to us on that's oddities podcast <coughs> oh my god it's king Todd's curse <coughs> <laughs> Out of these podcasts at gmail dot the fuck com. Can you move away from oh the microphone, my God. please? Crikey, I've caught the black lung. <laughs> oh my God, that really was King Tut's fucking curse. It sure was. Or was it coincidence? Oh my God, I could go for a butt of wine right now. Thank you guys. Be nice to each other yes. and have a great fucking day. Be Thank the you. shining star that you are. Yes, please. Okay, bye. <laughs> oh God.